Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Popular Music Books in Process series, a joint project of IASPM US, the Journal of Popular Music Studies, and the Pop Conference. I'm Carl Wilson, one of the series organizers, along with Gus Stadler, Francesca Royster, Eric Weisberg, and Kimber Kimberly Mack. Uh, we'll be doing events bi weekly into midsummer and then taking a break and picking up again in the fall. You can find our whole calendar on the IASPM website under the Journal of Popular Music Studies tab and get on our mailing list by contacting Eric Weisberg. You can also catch up on videos of all of our past sessions on Eric's YouTube channel, including our last event with David Cantwell on his book about Merle Haggard, The Running Kind. Next time, on June 28th, we'll have Steve Waxman discussing his new book, Live Music in America, with Simon Frith. But today we're very pleased to present Karen Rose in conversation with Alison Federstock about Karen's recent book, Why Patti Smith Matters. Of course, it's part of the University of Texas series, Why X Matters. There's a discount code you can use to purchase it at 40% off, which we'll put into the chat. And now quick bios on today's guests. Karen Rose is a music writer, archivist, and historian who has contributed to publications such as Pitchfork, NPR Music, Vulture, Salon, Polestar, and Billboard, among others. In 2018, she authored five essays ranging from Aretha Franklin to Joan Jett for the anthology Women Who Rock. And in 2017, she contributed an essay on Maybell Carter to the essay collection Woman Walk the Line, and her new book Why Patti Smith Matters came out in May. Alison Federstock is a New Orleans-based writer, editor, and longtime radio DJ, a freelance editor and columnist for the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, and a former staff music critic and arts reporter at the New Orleans Times-Picayune. Her writing about popular music and culture has appeared widely, and she's served as a music consultant or talking head for projects on HBO, CNN, and Netflix. As an oral historian, her long-form interviews with musicians and cultural figures are collected variously in her 2011 book, The Definition of Bounce, and in multimedia and museum projects, including at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. As always, during their conversation, please post your questions as you think of them in the chat sidebar. In the last part of the session, Gus will use them to call on you to ask in the Q&A. And of course, we also encourage you to use the chat for comments and conversation. However, I'll we'll ask Karen and Allison to ignore the chat while they're presenting. They'll be able to respond in the Q&A and we'll send them a copy of the transcript later so they won't miss any of the comments. And now I'll turn things over to Allison to get us going. Yeah, thank you so much. And we have a really good crowd. Um, so Karen actually prepared a short solo presentation with some slides uh, that I think we're going to start off with and then we'll get into the back and forth. So. Take it away, Karen. Um, yes, uh, this is really going to be more of a uh, comedy presentation, I think, then. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Please shout, someone. Oh, shit. Am I doing the right thing? No, I'm not sharing my screen. There we go. There we go. OK, I'm going to. Again, I should have practiced this, but again. Um, so the sort of vague uh, title of my presentation is when your subject is also your competition, researching why Patti Smith matters. Um, really do it. Here we go. Sorry, I apologize. Please feel free to mock me <laughs> in the chat. So a long time ago, I'm writing the proposal for why Patti Smith matters in the competitive landscape. What's the first book? Just Kids. <laughs> that sort of uh, mimics my, you know, um, when I actually sat down and thought about what I was about to do. Um, I helped by, by this, uh, gave a couple of years ago when she was, uh, when Just Kids was nominated for a program called One Book, One City, where all of the city of New York reads the same, is reading the same book. Um, people used to come up and thank me for horses. Now they thank me for Just Kids. Um, so when I was working through the first draft, um, there were two things that I did. 
And it's not at all intimidating that my editors are on here on this call. Um, but I literally wrote in one place, well, Patty got to New York and you can read all about that in Just Kids, so you should go do that. Um, because at the time, I, 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 my thought was, well, I can't possibly do it better than Patty Smith. So, so why help my readers' intelligence? Um, and thankfully, I was persuaded uh, to not do that. Although it is funny when we review, one of the reviewers commented, you know, there's a bunch of stuff in here about New York and it's really well written and everything, but you know, it's, it, does, it doesn't really add anything. And I'm like, okay, I'm a little bit vindicated by my thoughts. Um, the other thing is horses. Um, I handed in the draft and I believe it was Evelyn who said to me, Where, where's horses? Because they basically sort of said they recorded, they went to Electric Lady, they recorded horses. And again, it was the same sort of thinking of what could I possibly add to the conversation about horses? Um, you know, there's every word that has been, that has ever, every word that has needed to be said about horses has been said. I do, I do not need to add anything to that. Um, but I was again challenged on that. And, um, and it's funny now when I'm doing interviews, I'll, I'll get questions like, oh, the passage on horses was just so compelling. And it fe felt like you waited 40, you know, that was 40 years of waiting to write about it. And I don't wanna disappoint them by saying no, none of those things. Um, but the lesson here for me and, and for that I would wanna share with anyone else is, it's not that I was, um, cowed by the thought of I'm competing with Patty Smith because I it's a it's a completely different sort of book but um and and this is something that Allison Fenstersock says to me often when I say oh I have this idea but somebody already wrote an article and she'll be like yes but you have not written the article um again you're if you're writing the book and you're doing the research it's because people they, they want to hear what you are, have to say about it and chances are your um, your take and your thoughts are not as superfluous as you think. I also uh, meant to start this talk by saying I am not an academic. I have a master's in business. So please, uh, anybody on here who is an academic, please forgive me for not being particularly academic. Um, will this, let me go to the next slide. Uh, so what you see here is my little home library cart. Uh, when I wrote the book, when I was writing the book, I was living in a one bedroom apartment in Astoria, Queens. I did not have a lot of room and I could not constantly be moving books around. So I bought, I bought myself a little library cart and then I could like wheel it into the kitchen or the bathroom and hide it when I was not doing it. Um, I still have, this is recent. Um, I'm terrified that the minute I put the books away, I will be asked to write yet another essay and I will need to pull them all out again. So they're, they're there. Um, you know, and then going through and going through. So again, if we're talking about just kids or any of the, the books that are out, the, these were some of the questions I was asking myself, what's missing? Why is it missing? Does it matter? Why does it matter? Um, where can I find it? Is this something I intend to use in the book or is it just deep background for me? Um, one of the really valuable lessons I learned in this book was that what I, I always used to give myself a hard time for over-researching and I, you know, I, I saw it as a waste of time and that I wasn't sufficiently organized and I didn't have a good enough research plan. And that's not it at all. There's a reason every single thing that I, I, no matter how far out I go, I almost always, it informs something, it shapes something. Um, again, some of you that have been doing this for decades are sitting here going, duh, I'm sure, but it was for me, um, now I say something, well, it's just part of my process. It's just what I need to do. If I, if I feel the need to run it down, there's 
I also rely that there's something in my brain, kind of like how Keith Richards calls himself the antenna, not that I'm comparing myself to Keith Richards, but things arrive and, and he just transmits them. And it's like, okay, if something's telling me to go run this down, I'm gonna go run it down because it might not be for this project, but it might be a building block that will help me in a future project. Um, my, my office is not very clean. Um, let's see. Come on. Oops, nope, that's not what I wanted to do. Is it going to let me do this? I'm just going to stop sharing and talk. Um, some other things I learned that I wanted to talk through in terms of research. Um, don't neglect the obvious. Um, the music press was not the best place to find the kind of details or color that I was looking for and that I thought that was really absent from some of the existing resources. Um, the next bullet point says, when the Wayback Machine isn't enough, um, if you're not, I am really familiar with the Wayback Machine, but this particular project really challenged me because there were, I, I was trying to get some pieces from, from Addicted to Noise and they were only on Addicted to Noise and they were written by someone who was no longer with us. So I couldn't even call them up and be like, hi, could you send me your, your thing? Um, and I was, I literally had to sort of take the syntax of the URL and experiment with changing parts of it, variables in it to try to get the the, the, the fifth and sixth pages of a six page article when only four were in the Wayback Machine. Um, the next bullet says in quotations, can you talk to Bruce tomorrow? Is 2 p.m. okay? Um, it took me a year to get Bruce Springsteen to talk to me um, and multiple different packaging of the requests. Um, I just kept trying and I knew that if it happened, I could put it into the book. And if it didn't happen, the book was not gonna suffer without it. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things that I was asked, I asked him questions that nobody had ever really asked him before. Um, Beyondnewspapers.com, that's basically my uh, exhortation to say, if you can't find something, ask your, ask your colleagues, ask your friends, ask in the group chat. Um, if you don't have, uh, you know, if your library can't get you something, somebody is, is probably going to be able to get it for you. And no matter how annoying you think you're being, people want to help. People want to help you. Um, you know, it's not like you're turning up and saying, uh, like certain people on, on social media, like, tell me what your favorite uh, album cover back notes are like you it's 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 different um yeah those were those points um and the last thing I sort of wanted to talk through a little bit before handing this over to Allison for the more conversational part of this is this wasn't a book that relied heavily on interviews um I knew I wasn't going to to, to talk to even try to talk to Patty. Um, Casey gave me a letter of it at my request, gave me this sort of letter of introduction that I sent for people that basically said, I'm doing this book. It's not gonna be a bad book. Please let people talk to me. Um, I sent some questions to Lenny K at the beginning. I also didn't know if he was going to, you know, respond or not. I knew he was working on something. Um, Lenny sometimes just doesn't answer his email. That's his way of not dealing with stuff, which is an excellent way to deal with things. Um, and again, I didn't hear, I, I, I didn't hear back from him and it didn't really matter. Um, fans, there were some diehard, very well, very thoughtful people that I know in the fan community that I really had, I really had hoped there would be more of a voice of those people. And a lot of them just didn't want to talk. They just didn't want to go on the record. They didn't want their name associated with it. Um, so I, 
I thankfully got one person who was sort of, she, uh, uh, Teresa Karyakis, who's a photographer, she's not really, but she was an early fan and kind of used her as the, as a voice of the fans. So I had that representation in the book. Um, famous fans, there were people I tried to talk to. And again, nobody, it's like when I wrote about Joni Mitchell, um, nobody, nobody wants to go on the record either way because they're afraid of saying a word wrong that will offend their, 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 their hero. Um, so again, it, it was, it ended up being fine. Um, and we, we talked, we just talked about Bruce. Um, yeah, that, that is, uh, that is my short presentation. And with that, I, I throw it to uh, Allison. Right on. Well, I, I wanted to start by, by going back to the first idea in your presentation or just the first slide, which is, you know, like what if the number one comp for your book is a book by the subject of your book? Um, and I think it's really interesting to think about how, I mean, a work of memoir, especially by an artist is a work of art. It's not a work of reporting necessarily, you know, and in the, in the best case scenario, you know, memoir will give us details, you know, and interiority to their lives that we don't know about. In the worst case scenario, thinking about like Dr. John's autobiography, you know, people can be very unreliable narrators of their own life. Um, I think there's at one point in the book where you actually write very approvingly about the New York Times review of M Train uh, Patty's second memoir and said they reviewed the writing, they reviewed it as a piece of art, whereas a lot of reviewers acted like they were sort of reviewing her life, you know, so you see the memoirs as works of art, did you see them as something you had to fact check, um, and how did how'd you go about using them in your own research? Um, so the, the one, the one good thing is that Patty is famously very good with dates um, in, in a way I was never, have never at any age been. Um, but that doesn't mean that I still wasn't checking to make sure that it was, you know, just making sure for myself and reminding myself and putting things in a timeline and making sure the timeline was consistent. Um, and what I tried to use the book for was to see if it would, uh, and a good example is she talks about how, you know, after she does her, that first reading at, um, at the St. Mark's Church, that she had a lot of offers. People wanted her to do all sorts of things. And she doesn't really go into detail on what those things are. But she does talk about how she went to work for Steve Paul, who was as some some or many of you know, is was sort of a 60s impresario. He owned a club, he managed bands, he had a small record label. Um, and I really, unfortunately he's no longer with us because I, re but I really tried digging in to see if I could get, was there more out there about her time uh, working with him and, there were a lot of crumbs and with a lot of work and effort, I could have pulled them together, but it, it, it sort of goes back to how important was it? That really wasn't the most important part of, of the book. Um, another thing in there is uh, when she talks about her manager, Jane Friedman, I, I would have killed to have a conversation with her, but she she famously has never, on principle, has never done an interview um, because she sees herself sort of in service of the artist she works for. Um, and it would have been, uh, you know, I, I, I and, and she's incredibly hard to find and I could have called in a bunch of chips and a bunch of favors, but um, I, I sort of decided what, what was out there was was enough for this book anyway. Did I answer your question, Alison Benson? Yeah. Stop. yeah. Okay. Um, and th this is almost uh, kind of the flip side of, of asking about 
you know, chasing down facts. Um, but like one thing that I know that, you know, has been a little bit annoying in the reviews, I hope, I feel like you've also tweeted about this, so I'm not telling your secret, is that um, people often mention just the tone of enthusiasm in the book and they've used language like, I think one was the adoring standpoint of a true fan, um, almost in a, a diminishing way, you know, of using fandom as a way to describe uh, the point of view that you wrote the book from, which like one, as an aside, I feel like most people don't write a book about something that they don't like, you know? So like, why would you do that? I mean, I guess there is a place for that, but anyway, um, what, I don't know, how did you feel when that was written about the book? And then how do you feel about your position as a fan, you know, as an avowed fan? And, and the way that you, you made that very much a part of the book deliberately. It wasn't something that readers ferreted out. You know, it was, it was very much there at the forefront on purpose. Um, there, was a there was a point in my career as a writer where I was kind of trying to hide it, that I was a fan of the music I was writing about. And... Um, some of it had to do with being a woman and always be, you know, the assumption always being that you're there because you want to make kissy face with whoever the artist is. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there was, there was a point at which I realized, no, this is actually my strength. This is actually one of the things that makes me good at what I do. Um, but it is, it is kind of infuriating because people will say stuff like, oh, it was such a labor of love. And I'm like, no, it, it was actually not. It, it was, the, I, I don't want to go through all the reasons I, I wanted to do this book, but it wasn't like, oh, I love Patty Smith so much and I want to do this for her. Um, there's a lot of other ways I could show my appreciation. I would just be, keep leaving comments on her Substack. Um, <laughs> but I, I think that, um, uh, a friend who was a former music writer, um, you know, I, I, when she sent me a note about it, she was like, the footnotes are a joy. And I think that if you don't know, if you don't have never had to approach something from such a, you know, such a, from a place where you are doing copious end notes and you're attributing everything and you're looking at everything, you, you don't have the language to be like, this book was really well researched. And if you could go through, you know, there's pages of footnotes um, and she's consulted every conceivable source if I can pat myself on the back. So I think that's, I think that's some of it. But if I was a man writing about Led Zeppelin, no one would ever say, oh, this right, was such the a adoring standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. No, no one would no one would say the, no one would say that. They would just be like, oh, this person worked really hard and, and it's incredibly detailed and incredibly well-researched. And it's, it's, it's infuriating. Um, but I mean, so is, so is life is infuriating. <laughs> um, I, I, I feel like the people that I, I I hope that the as as this goes on and as as time moves on that it will get the recognition for for the work and not and and will lose the oh such a great such a big fan I do worry I do worry that it will scare people not scare people away or make them think like oh you know you know I'm thinking of that scene in Almost Famous I know you will hate me for this. Um, where she's like, he's just a fan. Like people would be like, oh, she's just a fan. Um, you know, like people, I, I was joking about this the other day that I need to change my, my profile to say, yes, I have read Just Kids because I keep getting that comment. And, and I'm trying to be generous and like, oh, people are trying to have a conversation and that's the only thing they know about Patti Smith. So they're gonna say, have you read Just Kids? It's really good. I don't know, but I, maybe they would do that to a man. I don't know. Well, I mean, there's also like, let's not diminish the power of the fan. I mean, as you, you were saying earlier, some of your, your research tips, you know, and your leads came from fans. And I think there is no researcher like a true fan, you know, and some, there are 
message boards that are actually incredibly valuable archives of just the way people ferret out the things that they're passionate about, you know, the information about that. And that's incredibly yeah, valuable. I mean, there's there's I, there's somebody in the acknowledgement, uh, this gentleman in Philadelphia, Tony Rizzapella, I really wish he would have agreed to talk to me because we had been running into each other in early internet fandom in various spaces. Um, and, you know, before everybody had a, had a blog and a website, he was an IT guy. So he could do things like, um, he curated a website that was uh, crotch shots of Mick Jagger from performance. Uh, he was a gay man. And this was something that had never been done. And it was something he, he felt needed to exist. Mm -hmm. um, but he, he also was typing out every Patti Smith article and it was on his website. And I had saved these years ago. Um, I don't know why. I just kept saving stuff to Evernote, like, oh, the internet it might go away. Um, you know, th those sort of, th that, those sort of, eff those sorts of efforts. Um, yeah, no one's gonna, no one is going to val you know, do that sort of work for free than a fan. Sorry, just the the Mick Jagger crotch shot website just made me think of like like digital plaster caster. You know? Seriously, <laughs> I I it's he he's taken it all down now, which is mm. which is too bad. I did look for it recently when the Stones were on tour. Um, but anyway, so back to Patty and back to fandom. You also chose to interweave elements of memoir yourself with sort of more chronological like, you know, critical biography of, of Patty as an artist. Um, and I think there's a real conversation, you know, going on between you and her, like you as a, a reader, as a listener, as a concert goer, as you kind of grow up with her as this beacon <clears throat> in your life. Um, why did you choose to do that? You know, and how did it come together? Um, that was definitely another thing that, you know, that that's something that I'm not used to doing. Mm. It, you know, you're not supposed to be in your pieces. Um, and, and it's definitely something I've struggled with over the years because I prefer when I can bring myself in, not in a, not in a um, self-indulgent kind of way, but in a way where, where it, it there's no way that my experiences are that unique and they're universal enough that somebody else is going to be able to bring themselves into the work by saying, oh, yes, I, that happened to me. Yes, I remember feeling like that or having that thought when I listened to that song or saw that concert. Um, but but it was also definitely something that that Casey and Evelyn really challenged me to to do more of um, in the book. And, and it was, it, it, I, you know, it was definitely, I felt like I was kind of tightrope walking without a net for a little bit because it had just been hammered into me for years. Like, don't, you're not, you know, that kind of writing's for like your blog, not for your live journal, not for a serious book from a serious press. Um, and, and I feel like it, it, you know, it's not a lengthy, it's not a, a funny thing happened on the way to the Patti Smith concert mm -hmm. um, kind of thing. That, that's a that thing we say, that's a, that's a backstreet Bruce Springsteen thing where there's a guideline, like, do you want to send us something? A funny thing happened on the way to the Bruce Springsteen concert stories are in abundance. Mm -hmm. um, there's definitely a difference and, and, Anyway, that, that um, now I'm just rambling, but that those are the sort of things that I was, that I was, you know, and also just the, you know, the, the way people ask me about, um, I've had a lot of questions about like, oh, did, you know, how did you land, uh, Jeannie Fury asked me that at, in my event in New York, was asking me like, how did you land on opening the book with the, the scene of you watching her in concert. And I'm like, well, literally, that's the first thing I wrote down. I didn't know, I thought like, well, at least I can get, if it's a personal thing, maybe I can get away with it in like an intro. Um, but it, it never really changed 
it, it never really changed in any of the shape of the books forms. Anyway, I'm, now I'm rambling. No, I just saw in the chat, Carl pointed out that it is, it's really common for writers to need outside people to poke them, to put more of themselves in the text. And I've definitely noticed a lot of, of, of recent music books, um, more from trade publishers, have that element of memoir and just, I don't know, I almost want to say like confessing to the experience of being a listener, like putting yourself in there, sort of not being a distant critic, not being a distant historian or reporter, but like admitting the fact that you it's music is something we listen to. It's something we respond to and engage with, and it can be very personal and it shapes our lives, which you wrote about beautifully, you know, in your book. Um, I think, I don't know, I, do you have any thoughts about that trend? I mean, I think it, it actually adds a lot of depth um, to writing about music at book length, you know, even from very yeah. serious scholars. I, I, again, I think it, that it, is that it, doing that is a way of sort of open, making, making the train friendlier for mm. your average bear, you know, for somebody who would not think of themselves as someone who would read a book about an artist. Um, if they pick it up and there, there's some, there's some, again, there's some, there's, there's personal, because people, people get intimidated. Um, they think, they don't, they don't know, they don't, they don't think, they think they don't know anything or they think they know everything. And then they read a, start reading a book and go, oh crap, I don't know anything. But if you, if, if you're the, 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 the experiences that we have as music fans are, are you, are more universal than I think many people stop to consider. And I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm talking about why I think it's good. I don't know why it's a trend. Um, mm -hmm. I have no idea why it's a trend, but I think it's good. Well, maybe it's a trend because it's good. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it sells. Um, anyway, uh, well, what are some of the ways that, I thought there were some through lines in, in the way you talked about Patty as your beacon, um, you know, that had kind of been with you as, as you like found the courage to kind of like become yourself, to move to New York. Um, one thing you did keep returning to was just like this admiration for the rigor of her work ethic. Um, and that was something that you, I feel like you end, you end the book on it. There's definitely like several sections where you return again, you know, just write, write very approvingly um, about that. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, why you zero in on that as, as an element of her art. Um. So there's a couple of reasons. One is because she does so much that like is just a blip to people. Mm -hmm. um, the amount of books she has written introductions for, and that and there and when you you read them, you, this isn't just like a, oh my friend so and so. It's like there's she puts this the you know an incredible amount of effort. Um, like there's, she wrote, she wrote the forward to this, like, uh, serigraph that, on um, Anne de Mulemeester, um, which is not anything I would have, like, run into on a daily basis, um, and ju just, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, artist, Lynn Davis, um, she does photographs of, uh, of, uh, large nature things like uh, mountains and icebergs anyway um she's written introductions to her books um she wrote an introduction to little women there's a blake book like there, she's there's constantly little things she's doing she's doing maybe if they say introduction by patty smith somebody will pick the book up um sorry no need to know all of that um but what and, and I, I talk about this, it, I, I touch on this briefly, but nobody glamorizes hard work. Everybody makes it seem like it, 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 that, they, that they get there just by magic. Like you hear the stories of, oh, I was just walking down Park Avenue and I said, oh, I would love Oh, did Karen disappear for everybody else? 
Yeah, I think mm. she. Yeah, she was a little bit made, freezy. She was she breaking up a little and then disappeared. Yeah. I'm back. Sorry. Sorry, I won't be able to see. What was the last thing I said, Allison? Do you remember? Um, you were starting to say like you know people act as if you know like the I think what where you were going with it was like oh I'm just walking down Park Avenue as if like the visitation of art is like a thunderbolt yeah you know, fully formed without it's not e it's it's not even that it's it's opportunity it's it's um I think Lizzo did a an interview with at the beginning of this sort of surge of her popularity where she said there is no such thing as an overnight sensation. Any mm. overnight sensation has been working for years. You just didn't hear about, it. you just didn't know them. And Patty never pretended that, you know, the muses arrive on her desk and bring mm. her the magic words. The, the work happens because you do the work. And, you know, being in New York City at the beginning of the OOs, coming back home and, and trying to make my way as an artist. And, you know, I'm watching, I don't know, Paris Hilton get a book contract and just sort of feeling like I don't, you know, it, this is, am I going about this all wrong? Um, having her just, she, she's, she doesn't, she doesn't um, hide it. She doesn't pretend it's not work. She calls her concert jobs. Yeah. Um, I I think that people think, I mean, yes, I believe there was an element of, of magic. Like there's an element of magic that put Robert Maplethorpe in that apartment that her friend used to, like, I think I believe in those things, but you still have to do the work and the, the magic, you, you can run into the magic if you're doing the work, but magic isn't just gonna like show up. I'm sounding like a crazy woman now. No, but, and I but, think especially for women and especially for artists of color, respecting the, the rigor and the diligence and acknowledging that practice is incredibly important because those are people who are much more likely to be like, oh my God, Beyonce is a goddess or like Joni Mitchell, she's magical. Or I, I feel like you remember me complaining when uh, a million obituaries of Fats Domino came out and so many of them that were from outside here in New Orleans were like, he was a happy, magical man who was just full of New Orleans fairy dust. And it was like, I mean, he, played, he practiced every day. He worked really, 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 really hard. You know, it's, he's not just sort of a magical sprite from the bayou. Anyway, and, and, and Patty is not a magical visitation from the heavens. Like she does the labor. You know, and, and, and it's, and it's, this is, this is one of the reasons why it was so infuriating to her when she left public life and moved to Detroit and got married and had kids and be like, oh, she's not doing anything. And, and really, really? You just, you, just because you can't see it. And, and uh, there's, there's other directions. I, I, I'm not gonna go down the people don't, didn't like her because when she moved here, she decided to hang out with Fred and have family and not go hang out at all the punk rock bars. Um, uh, you just for somebody to 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 not it, it she doesn't glamorize it. She's it's hard work. I get up every morning and I write, and I and I have to you know. And she'll and she says this now in her her stack videos. We're like tomorrow's will be here. Have to do this. I have um it just that was for me and still is kind of a talis a talisman like. It's just, just keep working. Like if you just, if you, it is definitely a thing that kept me working when I was writing, you know, I was working five, I was working at a full-time job um, in technology. And then I was spending all day, one day on the weekend and at least one evening after work writing, going to a writer space, because in New York, nobody has room, so you have a membership in a writer space. No, I, I did not want to, that's not fun. <laughs> like I'm saying this to a bunch of academics. It's, it's, it's not, it's, 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 
you know, I used, I remember like, I wish I had a normal life and I could just like go to the park, like, and not have a care in the world. And I could do that, or I could work on my art. Um, also go to the park for like, right. But you know bit. what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not spending every weekend in a Karen park with a, with a, with a margarita from the turkey's nest. This is a very Brooklyn specific reference I'm making right now. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Um, I, I, and she still, she still does it. And I'm glad, and she doesn't, she doesn't care what you think. She really doesn't care what you think. And God love her. And it's got her pretty far. For sure. Um, this is going back a little bit, but I, I had like a, a little tributary off of the fandom river that I wanted to go down, which is when you think about Patty and fandom, I mean, at least for me, it wasn't obvious, but then I realized like she is one of the greatest fans of all time. I mean, her work is so much in conversation with, I mean, you know, like Rambo and Blake at the beginning as a celebration and then people that she actually was able to engage with like Dylan and Allen Ginsberg, um, who else? And Kurt Cobain. Uh, you know, her, her collaborator, Lenny Kay, is like, you know, the number one fan of all time, like. Well, and it's, um, there's a, there was a part of the book, there was a part in the book which, which, which I had to cut, which was um, Lisa Robinson mm -hmm. filed a report from the Stones in Atlanta in 78 when, when, uh, at the Fox and Patty got to open, Patty and the band got to open. And then she spent the, Patty spent the whole stone set in the photographer's pit, just like dancing and yelling and, you know, arms in the air and Mick throwing water on her. And I love that Lisa captured that. And um, she, she's, yeah, she, she, again, it's one of those, I don't care if it's, if you think it's cool, I think it's cool. Mm. You know, um, they, they definitely wore their hearts on their sleeves. Like you were saying about Lenny, but like, if you look at the, the, and there, there's, there's, this is in the book where I sort of talk about how, you know, Nuggets uh, created a sort of lingua franca for, for everybody, for, for those for the, the gang that was coming out of CBGBs. Um, and mm -hmm. it was understood, understood this stuff is good. This stuff is, we, we believe in this stuff. This stuff is, it, it, we're, we're standing on top of that stuff to make our stuff. Um, I love being this articulate. Um, you know, she, and you know, I think, and also, the the there's another tributary. I, I want to go on fandom, and I did, and I, and I will. Nobody steal this idea, which <laughs> is, um, if you if you you know, I only saw Patty once before in '79 before she she uh, took a break. But one of the if you look at one of the things I knew that she did was she would have, she would like come out, she would read some poetry, and then she would stand on the edge of the stage and have a conversation with the audience. People literally yelling things at her. And, and she would just talk to them. And sometimes the things were dumb and she would say, that's dumb. Or other times she would, you know, what are you listening to? What are you reading? I'm reading this. What shows have you been to? Um, there, she plays at uh, CB's at the, at, after the show in Central Park that I saw, which was my first show, um, when she's like, how many of you in the park? Remember, I told you all, you need to make sure you hydrate. You need to have a cup of hot tea tomorrow when you get up because it poured, it was, it rained so hard. Um, and that's kind of what she does. I see a lot of that now and what she's doing in her Substack mm -hmm. and in her Instagram, um, more, more of the Substack but she, who thought it, we'd be in two, 2022, we would be sitting, I can sit in bed at night and Patty Smith is sitting at her desk going, oh, what's on Patty's desk? I have this, I have this, uh, this tincture. Um, here's my, and then your cat jump, like it's, <laughs> but, but it, it's, I find it to sort of be you, uniquely her 
and, and I think, again, to circle back to your original point, it's because she understands fandom because she was a fan and still is a fan. Um, well, you were starting to talk or you just referred to a couple of live shows and that was actually one of the topics um, <clears throat> that I wanted to touch on. Although I feel like we're like starting to run out of time, but not too much. So where are we? On? Yeah, I have no idea what I have no concept of time. But um, uh, you write a lot in, in the book about specific live performances, you know, either ones that you saw or ones that were particularly significant for her. And I know you personally as sort of a, a passionate consumer of live music and the way you wrote, I thought it was really interesting that you were, you were writing about her greater body of work and including live events almost as like texts in it. Right. Like, I, I think, I think they, they, they are, I think they can be significant. Like they can be even more significant. Um, but it's not, it's not product, mm -hmm. you know, she's, she's, yes, she does it because it's how you can make, how you make money. Um, but it's, it's, there, there's something very grateful daddy in it, in that it's, it's, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, it, it, it's a different thing every time. And it's, it's, it's funny to me it, in that, in that sort of like deadish, where are we going? What's the energy going to bring us? Um, it, and she is very good at that. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's in one of the improvisational um, numbers that that are on that have been on every record or um, just or, or or what some of the songs like, I, again, I, I, I this is a, a dead horse I keep beating, which is beneath the beneath the Southern Cross, which is mm -hmm. I will put up against anything she did in the 70s. It, it, it is just. I was in Paris on, on Rimbaud's birthday wow. and, and they, they did it. And it was just, it was like, we all elevated up just a little bit. Um, so, so yes, that's a, that's a long yes. Um, I lost my train of thought. Um, well, I guess like this was, well, a couple other things. I wanted to make sure we get to this, um, which is like you, it's, it's bringing together a couple of different parts of the book, which is one, you, you spend like some very thoughtful time on her presentation of her look, you know, like her very simple, unadorned, but like very deliberate look. And there's, um, I wonder if it's easy to find when I marked it, especially when you write about, um, the cover of the outfit on the cover of horses, that iconic outfit, and you you parsed it so amazingly and found all these little signals in it, like just comparing the suit jacket over her shoulder to Sinatra and the pin on her lapel, um, the, the rooster hairstyle, and you you called it, the, the cover of horses was as much a state as the music inside. Um, and then also, you know, like when you get to Easter, we have like some rants about like, you know, why we have to keep talking about armpit hair. But um, yeah, like the, her, her visual presentation is so understated and so unadorned, but so important, like the uniform. Yeah, yes. I mean, it. you know, we used to have for, for years, you and I had conversations about how much we admired the uniform because she always looked cool. She always looked like herself. She always looked put together. And, and, you know, I tried, you, it's, you know, it's that, um, there's that quote in the book that I took from uh, George O'Keefe. Um, she did this exhibit. There was that O'Keefe exhibit at the Brooklyn Museum. Some of you may remember. And I remember she she said that she was trying to come up. I'm, I'm not remembering exactly, but it was like she was trying to come up with like a consistent thing to wear so she would have more time to paint. And I saw that and my head exploded. And, and, and I, I, you know, that that is is I she's never talked about it. 
but but it but but I believe that that's the reason for it. And then sort of in parallel to that, it's it's sort of the the horse's couture, as I call it, you know, she she wears it when it's important. She mm -hmm. wears it, you know, with, um, that 40th anniversary horses tour, everyone in the band wore the white shirt and the tie and the black jacket and the black pants. Um, and, and there's probably, you know, again, this was already the longest Music Matters book. So, um, there, there was, there's, there was more I wanted to do with that, mm -hmm. but it would have required research, heavy research into areas of fashion, I, things I know nothing about. And that was one of those, okay, this would be fascinating, not, not for this book. I think this, this might be, I don't know, this could get naughty and it could also be a good question to transition into the Q&A on, um, but coming from her look, you know, which is not traditionally feminine, I'm interested in how you kind of approached her uh, sort of singular relationship with femaleness and femininity. Um, there is a point where you, you say you wish she had been more overtly allied um, with feminism. Like she said that she's, you know, she said some things that were a little bit disappointing. Not that she said, it was, it was, it's one of those, I'm not a feminist, but everything else, I'm, everything I'm saying is feminist. Um, she said stuff like, you know, she didn't experience gender discrimination, but you do, you specifically quote all throughout the book, you know. Her experiencing people. gender discrimination. Yeah. And I, I, again, I, my, I don't care. It, it's, oh, I'm sorry, I'm thinking. So, so this is something I, I, I've thought a lot about my entire life and also real thought really hard in this book. And I think that if I had to, if I had to guess, and I realize this is really presumptuous. So if this gets back to anybody, it's fine. But I think that There, there was a couple of things. One is she didn't want to get her work and what she was trying to do lost in the, the, the 70s debate about feminism, which was dumb. It was d dumb. And then you would have all the, you know, you would have all these men asking her questions about feminism and not about the music. So she's just not gonna go there. Um, I think that also if, you say something didn't happen to you, then it didn't happen to you. And um, I, I, I touch on this like a little bit, like I barely was of age in that era. And I know how f situations I got into that were fairly frightening. I can't imagine the situation she found herself in with predatory men of various stripes. Um, and if, and, and I, and I, I don't want to say it, it's a little bit bravado, but I don't mean it in a pejorative sense. I mean it in a sort of armoring herself sense. Like if this, if I don't acknowledge it, then maybe it won't happen to me. Does, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. totally. um, I mean, that, those are the sort of vague thoughts I, I, I had about it. Um, and it's, again, it's, it's kind of voodoo, so it's not anything I would have written, written and, and, and avowed, but I, I do, I do think that that was some of it. Compare that to the Lilith Fair response, which is just, um, I don't think, I don't think, and again, I don't know, and I know people are doing work on this. I don't know that she got the right message about what they why they wanted her to be part of Lilith Fair um and because her her response to it was so disconnected from what it was that that that's the only thing that I can think is that she did not the right message did not get conveyed mm -hmm. um and or or there was something else that went on that, and she was insulted or maybe the money wasn't good for her. I don't know. And she was sort of like, no, I'm not, I don't need to be part of something um, 
you know, there's women that need to be part of something because they're women. Um, I don't, I'm not going to, I don't, I don't remember what's in my book and what's not in my <laughs> book. I'm not going to remember quotes. Um, <clears throat> I hope I answered your question, Allison. Yeah, and I think like we're just hitting, well, for me, it's five, I guess for you guys, it's six. Um, if, if you guys would like to uh, join in, um, the chat seems pretty hopping. How does this work? How chat. do we do this? So people? I will um, call on people who've put questions in the chat. And I think um, the first person is Lauren Anki. Uh, if you want to unmute yourself and um, ask Karen your question. Great, thanks. Hey, Karen, congratulations on the book. Um, this is a really great conversation. I'm wondering if you could just, you know, process wise, reflect a little bit on how you kind of re-listened and maybe reheard albums that have been so much part of your own life for so long. Because I thought one of the things that the book does really well is was to is you know it really introduces these albums in a way that felt really fresh to me. Like you know, for me, it was like what you did with Radio Ethiopia. I was like, oh man, right. So, but I just wondered how, as a writer and as a fan you kind of navigated going back to records that you know, like the back of your hand in a way that could engage the, the reader who could be really new to it. Um, it's a really good question. Thank you for asking that. Um, and I'm, I'm the, the wheels are turning, you cannot see them. So, I think that I listen to a lot of listen to a lot of music, um, but I'm always I'm you know I'm I spend so much time listening to live recordings and and exploring that sort of side of artists that I I just I think that. I don't, this is gonna, this just sounds, sounds. I have a way of approaching records that I think other, I, I just, I don't, I can't even tell you how I do it. It's just how I approach them. Um, I wish I could tell you, oh, whenever I do it, I do it this way. Um, it's not even, one of, one of the things I, I had put in my notes and then couldn't see in the slides was, I was grateful that this was something that I had just been so immersed in for so long that I didn't, you know, I wasn't starting from the beginning or even close to the beginning. I'd been, this has been, you know, a long conversation. So I could sort of pause uh, like, uh, kind of like a drone and be like, okay, I need to go over here now. And I need, I, but I can go, now I can go all the way in and focus on the micro, but I, I know what, the larger picture is. Um, I, you know, in some of the, like I never, I've never had a chance to write about Radio Ethiopia before. So it was fun to write about Radio, Radio Ethiopia. And again, like I said, I wasn't gonna write about horses and, and I'm glad I did. So, um, and I, and I, I really, I, and I actually talked about this with, with, with Bruce that I'm like, I'm amazed how I'm just not tired of this. I I still really get a lot out of out of listening to it. Um, and the other thing that I you know I I had this. I'll, I'm definitely going to do an Instagram post of this, but I have. I have, there were notes all over my house, everywhere on everything, because I'd be listening to something and I'd have a thought and I'd write it down. And, and I, I, I let myself do that. And it was, it, it was, I, you know, I wrote on envelopes. I wrote on things that were on my refrigerator. I wrote on my hand. I wrote, you know, everywhere. Um, I, uh, I, I, honored the the thoughts by recording them and then figuring them out later so that's sort of the best i can answer you thanks okay thanks um carl you have a you had a question you said may have become redundant but you do you want to ask some 
version of it or uh... yeah i'll try and spin off of it it was it was really interesting to me the way you um made the connection between ways that she's related to audiences in the past and what she's doing now in the Substack. but i i I'd just like to hear you talk more about the subject because it's it really remarkable to me, um, the intimacy of it and the sort of openness about process that goes into it. I've kind of never seen an artist use it quite the way that she does. And it feels like in some ways she's using it as a whole new phase of her work. And I'm, I'm just curious, I'd love to hear more of your observations about that. Um, I definitely think that she is using it as a new phase of her work. And I think it's um, giving, it's giving her something back that has been, that she didn't have when she came back. You know, when she, when she was, uh, when it was the Patty Smith group, she had, you know, um, there was a fan club newsletter and there was a PO box and her mom answered the PO box. Um, and, and, um, there are so many stories of, of artists that will tell you, yes, I wrote to Radio Ethiopia and I got a letter back from Beverly. Um, I, um, I, uh, my, my friend, uh, my late friend, Holly Kara Price, um, I was lucky to be given her Patti Smith stuff after her passing. And there's a letter from Beverly Smith in there because she wrote to Patti and she wrote to her. Um, and the thing about her substack is she talks about how she reads every single comment. She doesn't respond always, but she reads them. And you would think that when she said that, that that would then create like 40,000, oh, buddy, the soundtrack to my life. But it's, but it's not. And, and I also feel like she has this, she has this ability it's the same skill that let her deal with hecklers, which is she can scan a, a long list of things and see the important ones and, and tune out the things that aren't. Um, I, I am interested to see what else she, she decides to do with this, but I do think that it's, it's a way for her to to it, it gave her back something that she didn't ha, couldn't figure out how to still do, and it's yeah. The other thing is about it is that we she couldn't come back in 1996 and have the same sort of conversations with the audience because not everybody in the audience remember what it was like in 1976. But we all know how to make comments on in, on social media posts. So we're all coming to it from the same, a, a more level playing field, which is why I think it, it appeals to her um, and it's more egalitarian. It doesn't require any sort of special um, advanced not, insider knowledge. I don't, I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you. Uh, Francesca, did you wanna, I know you're, it's, you're sort of, Sure. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. I um, I really enjoyed this talk and the insights about Petty Smith and also about your writing process, Karen. Um, really cool. Also, just to hear your your intellectual friendship with Allison kind of on display in the conversation. It's very cool. Um, but my yeah, I was just thinking about um, with the question of Petty Smith's feminism and her distancing from it in some ways, we're not claiming it as a label. It echoed to me something that Toni Morrison had said about um, herself as a feminist, but this is way back um, maybe in the 90s when she said she didn't claim the label because she wanted as an artist to be able to move in all these different sides and not be bound by the ideology of, of isms. Though her work is certainly to me you know, very much black feminist. And later on, I think she kind of opens up her connections to feminism a little bit. But I was just wondering if you thought that that was also, could also be an element with Smith that her vision as an artist um, was someone who wasn't necessarily tied to those kinds of discussions or just to keep herself open. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's definitely part of it. 
you know, especially in, in the seventies when all of the isms were so charged and in it, in it meant a lot more to say you were something in particular. Um, I, I de yeah, I definitely feel, and also I was, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought for two seconds. Um, you know, the, one of the things she espoused in the seventies was that she was beyond gender. Um, and nobody knew how to deal with that. And all the, all the journalists were still writing about her boobs. I have a file in, in Scrivener called boobs. And it's just every quote that every, that everyone has ever said about her tits. Um, so I, I, again, that goes to sort of like the image of the armor. If I don't say I'm this and I, 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 I think there were, there's two parts to this one, what you were saying with the, the quote you were sharing from Toni Morrison, I think that was part of it. And I also think, again, some of it was just uh, at the high level, no, I don't want to limit myself by identifying with something to let that's going to lock me into something I may not want to be part of later. And also just sort of a, I'm trying to protect myself as an artist. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Evelyn McDonald, I'm assuming that's a rhetorical question, but do you do you want to um, use it to? to yeah, it was, <laughs> yeah, okay. It was a rhetorical question, but uh, <laughs> I don't know if Karen got to see it. I, I'm just, I think uh, holding female artists or any art, holding artists the litmus test of whether they're feminists or, or not, or um, as applied I, I suggest that it is applied far more often to women artists than it is applied to male artists. What's that? Yeah, violent agreement. And also thank you, Karen, for this great talk and your great book and such a pleasure to work with you. And thank you for, for allowing, uh, helping it happen. My pleasure. Well, we there aren't any other questions right now. I might I might actually ask one from the perspective of uh, um, I have to confess I haven't yet read the book, but um, I guess one thing I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about um, that I think intersects with a lot of things people have brought up is just um, I was thinking about how maybe like five or six years ago um, Patty Smith was uh, like a visiting artist at Bryn Mawr College, which is like, which is the sibling school of the college I teach at. And just the the response to her was so, so intense. Like, so, I mean, it was like, you know, you know, Beatlemania level kind of like, uh, at least, you know, in, in the initial performance she gave and, um, and um, I don't know, I guess I, I'm just, I'm still sort of trying to figure out, you know, what the nature of like a more contemporary, um, what 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 younger like college age women find um, find so tr um, transfixing in her, and, and how whether that's different from what you know brought the rest of us <laughs> into her, like how 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 that. Um, that fan relationship may have shifted with the times. Um, I don't, do you have any thoughts about that sort of like the yeah. younger generation of, of fans and especially female fans? So um, there's three things I can say about that. Um, when she did that, uh, that visiting artist at Bryn Marsh, that was a, 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 an entire year where she did similar things at art schools. Um, she did not publicize it. This was right after she had said, oh, I'm gonna, when she gave up the Bowery Ballroom, she used to do uh, three nights at the end of the year. Um, and she was like, I'm giving up the Bowery Ballroom. Someone else should do it. And she was going to stop performing and she didn't like it. And, and she's never talked to it publicly, but she, like she was, she went around the country to uh, graduate art programs and did some sort of intense sort of seminar with, with senior students. Um, 
And some of those talks used to be on YouTube and they're all gone. Like I, she, it, I didn't go into this in the book because there really is no record. And I didn't write it down when it happened because I didn't. Um, but I, I think that it hasn't really changed because we're not post-feminist, we're not post-race, we're not post-anything. It, it still sucks. And it, it, it sucks for young people in new and different ways, but just as bad. Um, and, I, and I think that, especially if you're in a younger generation where you're not ever gonna own a house, you're not, you know, when you, you don't have the, the, when what's ahead of you is fairly bleak. Um, somebody talking about work in a, in a way that isn't about benefiting capitalism is, is pretty great. Um, I also really appreciated that she would tell people, go somewhere else. You have to go somewhere else where it's cheaper to live. Unlike Lou Reed, who was like, oh, you could just go to Brooklyn. It's not really that expensive. Like, fuck you, Lou. When was the last time you had to pay rent in New York? Um, and the, and I think they, I think the other thing that they value is just, she's it's unadorned, you know, she's just telling you directly what she thinks. Um, I, I remember this is something I hope I'm going to do when I'm out doing my various book events, which is, uh, this was at uh, the New Yorker festival one year. And there was a lot of people to ask questions. People, these young girls were coming to the front and they were like, well, okay. and she would let them talk for a few seconds. And then she'd be like, do you have a question? And that would, you know, she would give them the minute to catch their breath and get the question. She wasn't dismissing them. She was just focusing them. And I, I'm, this is the closest you're going to get to an answer for me. Because I don't know, because I'm not a 20 year old woman, and I wasn't talking to 20 year old women. But I, I do, I, I stand next to them at concerts, and I feel like they're there for the same reasons that I'm there. Thank you, um, Ian Balfour. Do you want to? You have a kind of related question. It sounds like. I hey, think there, Ian he, needed that to be read out because he uh, said okay. the microphone wasn't working on his laptop. So. Oh, sorry, I missed. I didn't read the first <laughs> phrase. I guess. Um, so uh, he's asking. Um, I'm reading. I'm reading. Okay. Well, I'll just read it out for everybody. Yeah. I'm wondering how youngsters now get a sense of the wide array of Patty's canon. Very different from my generation who listened to each album and read each book as they came out. And do you have a sense of what matters most to people in their 20s and 30s? some of whom may be on this call. I, I don't, I bristle a little bit at saying, well, in our day, we did things the right way and we listened to the records as they came out and read the books as they came out. They, people read and they listen and they may not, they're not doing it in real time, but it's not any different than like a, a teenager finding out about the Beatles. They, they to what, in in whatever way they come to it is um, is valid. Um, I you know they I I do think that a lot of people came in from the book like she's the quote I I shared um, and I and I find that what just just kids brought in the different people that it brought in is it brought in people that heard about Patty back in the day and might not have been brave enough to pursue the music or going to see her. It brought back people who loved her, but maybe have lost touch. And it brought in people who would have never gone to see a Patti Smith concert in their lives. Um, her, her, that, that element of her. Um, I, I don't, you know, I don't know what, I mean, I can't really, people in their 20s and 30s are, are, are a vast body of people. So I don't really know um, what they all are, con what they all are concerned with. But I think that they, good music is good music. And, and 
if you go to a live show and it's a good show, it's it's a good show. Anyway, I don't know if that answered your question. Okay, thanks. Uh, Antonia Randolph, interesting question. Um, can you, can y'all see me? Okay, yeah, I was just, um, I heard Patty, thank you for this um, presentation about um, your book. Uh, this is off kilter because I heard Patty Smith talking on Fresh Air and I heard that she was from near Philly and I'm from Philly. And as you're we talking about Patty Smith's work, work ethic and her sort of um, everydayness and maybe think about working class white folks from Philly. And so I was wondering if there's any tie to um, in, um, to where she's from the region and kind of ethnic enclaves, those sort of things that might go into her presentation of self and how she approached um, music. Um, so she does talk about this, you know, in, in some, some books. Um, and I don't think it was, I don't know that it, it was different elsewhere in the country, but, you know, she, she can talk about things, you know, she, she, the thing that drew her and Lenny Kay together was their love of doo-wop and their love of that early sort of uh, organic kids getting together under the streetlight to sing. Um, and, and those, those early, you know, they know those early rock and roll cuts, but she, and, she, and so she was listening to Bob Dylan as much as she was listening to uh, doo or Benny King or Sam Cooke or Marvin Gaye. Um, and so I think that that's, that's a, it's not unique to Philly, but it is definitely part of Philly and South Philly. And, um, you know, she worked, she lived, you know, across the river, like where the bridge comes out. Um, you're from Philly, so I'm talking, I know you're what I'm talking about, you know, and now that's just like a land of strip malls, but back then it was still, um, you know, far there were, it was farmland that was starting to be broken up. Um, she, she tried, she bought the land across the street from her childhood home and the, they, the city took it away from her by eminent domain to build a soccer field. Um, and she's, she's, her childhood home is no longer there. And she, she said once, like, it's not even the same dirt because they just like leveled it and built something else. Um, so the, the, I mean, the, the South Jersey back then was really still a scary place. I mean, it's not that far South of the Pine Barrens. It was, it was, it was, it was different. Um, I can see the sort of regionalism of it. I don't know that it's that it's something that someone from the outside or someone who is um, younger can necessarily attune to, but I, I definitely think that that it's there and it was incredibly formative. Um, you know, listening to the radio, listening to there when there was so much radio back then to listen to, um, listening to to think. You know, she. She told this great story in at a show in Philly a couple of years ago about going to see the Motown Review at a drive-in um, in South Philly, and I I will find that day if it kills me. I keep looking for it. Um, I want to find an ad. Um, anyway, I hope I answered your question. Okay, I think. Uh... I think that's that's it. Thank you so much, uh, Karen and Allison, for this great conversation. And thanks everybody for coming. Um, as we said, there will be a recording of this posted on Eric Weisbard's YouTube channel um, by Thursday. It's usually up. Um, so if you want to tell your friends and colleagues who might be interested in watching, um, that's where they can find it. Um, we have uh, in two weeks. We have Steve Waxman um, presenting on his his work, uh, his book on live performance, um, in conversation with Simon Frith. So that should be exciting. 
So um, again, thanks for coming. Thanks, Karen and Allison, and we'll see you next time.